and sausages confiscated from German military stores. A treat for Norwegian children whose land for five long years had been occupied and systematically pillaged by the Germans. But now Norway celebrates its Independence Day. 25,000 school children march with flags and serenade Prince Olaf as he waves from the balcony. Norway, one of the United Nations, and a country that refused to bow to German domination, now holds her rightful place again among free peoples. Joseph E. Davies, special presidential emissary to London, returns to the White House to report to President Truman. And just back from Moscow is Special Representative Harry Hopkins, who had been charged with vital discussions in the Russian capital. Following talks with Truman and Chief of Staff Admiral Leahy, it was announced that plans for the forthcoming meeting of Truman, Churchill, and Stalin have been made. Here will be settled, frankly and openly, mutual problems arising from the end of the war in Europe. To Marshal Zhukov's headquarters in the fallen capital of Germany come Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower and Field Marshal Montgomery. With Nazi Germany dead, the military representatives of four United Nations meet to form an occupational administration. Marshal Zhukov, deputy of Stalin and conqueror of Berlin, reads the terms of the Allied Control Commission, previously agreed upon. For the Russians, Zhukov signs the document which will establish a stern but just government in Germany. Montgomery signs for Britain. General Eisenhower signs for the United States. General Delatre de Tassini represents France. Hitler and the monster state he created have been wiped out. Guided by free men and just rule, Germany faces a long period of occupation and reconstruction. In the victorious Battle of Burma, a British amphibious assault strikes for the recapture of Rangoon. In an invasion from the south, Lord Mountbatten's forces carry through the largest combined operation in Asia. As British troops move inland through monsoon mud, the Royal Air Force hits Japanese escape boats. These Japanese are right in the path of invasion craft. Clinging to life preservers, they are taken aboard a light vessel. Blindfolded for security, Prisoners are checked by intelligence officers and then transferred to internment ashore. Simultaneously, parachute troops invade from the sky in the second phase of the Rangoon attack. They seized and silenced enemy flank positions. The great Rangoon harbor is captured undamaged as the enemy flees. Crowds hail the triumphal return of British troops to Burma's capital marking the virtual end of the bitter struggle for Burma. In New York City, aided by trucks of the Department of Sanitation, citizens of the nation's largest city join in a major campaign to collect used clothing for needy war victims. To save time, apartment house families are asked to send their contributions down direct. School children gather up the bundles and speed them to waiting trucks. The generous response by civilian families who know of the need for warm clothing in Axis ravaged nations makes possible a large collection in record-breaking time. The trucks go off to waterside depots where the clothes are sorted, cleaned, and bailed for shipment. 
The entire operation is under the sponsorship of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. On board the Swedish ship Gripsholm, veteran of many Red Cross missions throughout the war, the clothing is loaded to be sent to critical areas designated by UNRWA. Thousands of tons for the relief of suffering sister nations. General of the Army Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces, is cheered by throngs of Londoners in a triumphant reception to the man who led millions of Allied troops to victory in Europe. General Eisenhower is granted the freedom of the city and is presented with a ceremonial sword. In Paris, at the Arc de Triomphe, General Eisenhower received the tribute of the French people and government. General de Gaulle decorates him with the Medal of Liberation. The American general honors the memory of France's unknown soldier, as all of liberated Europe honors the men of many nations who marched to victory under his command. Home again after a transatlantic flight, General Eisenhower is greeted by his wife and by a million of his countrymen at Washington. In an army jeep, America's returning hero begins a tour through the capital city, winning the highest praise of all of the United Nations for his brilliant military achievements, General Eisenhower now received the heartfelt tribute of the United States. of the Capitol building, wounded veterans of the European war are saluted by their commander. His car slows down and the general shakes hands with a few of the many who helped bring victory over Germany. joint session of the United States Congress, General Eisenhower is escorted to the stand with full honors. He brings a message from the soldiers of his command. The soldier knows how grim and black was the outlook for the Allies in 1941 and 1942. He is fully aware of the magnificent way the United Nations responded to the threat. To his mind, the problems of peace can be no more difficult than the one you had to solve more than three years ago, and which in one battle area has been brought to a glorious conclusion. He knows that in war, the threat of separate annihilation tends to hold allies together. He hopes we can find in peace a nobler incentive to produce the same unity.